so good to see you today. Uh, you can go ahead and grab your Bible and you can turn to 1 Peter. Now, there's not a Bible in the pew rack. They've already cleared it all out. Because as we've noted, we're starting tomorrow. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever traveled outside of the United States? I'm curious. How many of y'all have done that? Raise your hand if you have. Um, are you like me? You realize how precious it is to live in the United States of America. Amen? And some of us have been places all over the world uh, doing missionary work. I mean, some of y'all go on vacations around the world and you're like, no, I like where I was there better than here. But I've been on trips where we come back and literally, depending on where you're coming from, um, where we land and everyone on the plane erupts in applause. Have you ever experienced that? Like, yes, we're home. So I, uh, years ago, um, I was in Jos, Nigeria. Now, Jos is, is not a big city, but it's south of Kano. Um, you might know of Lagos or Kano in Nigeria. Um, and you know a little bit of what's going on in the church there with great persecution going on today. But it was happening even, even then. And so I, I went into Jos. I was traveling alone. Okay, first challenge. Um, and I arrived there, was going through customs, which seemed like a free-for-all. And I was pulled out and taken into an enclosed area with four armed soldiers. And they were going through all my stuff, asking me all kinds of questions. I've already been told that just, they just want money is what they want. I didn't give them any money, which prolonged my, my special time with them. Um, and then uh, I finally got out and was looking across the way. I could see my missionary who told me, oh, I got you. Oh, no, I do this all the time. And I, I just, I mean, it was wild. I finally made it through to him, and we ended up with an incredible week. I was preaching um, at all kinds of different places, speak, doing apologetics in a Christian school with a lot of MKs and expatriates and government official kids and such so had an amazing time but also spoke at different places at one point I was in a, a a building with hundreds of students and they were Muslim kids along with their you know administrators and all the teachers and everyone I was one of the few white people in the room and one of the very few Christians in the room and the whole time particularly going through customs and just landing there uh, throughout the time there I was like wow I I am not home I'm not home. Now, you don't have to go to Africa or some of us have been to places like India or, gosh, I've been to Venezuela, South America, I mean, all over the world. You don't have to go to the Middle East to feel like you don't belong. In fact, some of you really feel that way in your workplace, and some of us, some of us experience that a lot more than others, um, where you feel like, gosh, I'm the only person in the room that is, you know, like this. A lot of us experience that. But the Bible says, for Christians, if you don't live with an ambient, constant disconnect, a discomfort even, in this world, you likely are not living in the kingdom of God. And I want to talk about this today. It's what Paul said. Paul says it's a longing. It's a groaning within us. Something's not right. And we know we're not home yet. And we live in that tension. And today I want to talk about how we live in this tension. The, the fact, this approaching reality of all things made new. Of heaven and earth being united and God's will being done perfectly. And all of us without sin worshiping him. I mean, frankly, singing the songs that was amazing today, even our hymnody sometimes leads us into images that really aren't biblical. We take them literally. The world will not dissolve like snow. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that actually all things will be made new. So I, I can still track with, with John Newton there, I suppose. We're going to cast his, our crowns around the crystal sea Okay, imagery, right? But the Bible says that all of history is heading towards this uniting of heaven and earth. It's the whole arc of redemptive history. We talk about this often. And Jesus prayed. He taught us to pray. How about that? 
The, the Father's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he means now, right now, heaven, wherever his will is done, wherever his people are living in obedience to him, that's where heaven and earth come together. So heaven, I just want you to hear this, heaven is not just this off somewhere way out there place that we're going to get zapped to someday. Yes, there is a consummation of all things. We read about it in our dwell reading this week, 1 Corinthians 15. It says there's coming a day, and we sang about it. Just now. And your dwell reading, by the way, get your new manuals, I mean your new journals today. I've got mine that, um, that we kick into this week. Okay, so get yours on the way out. They're in the narthex over in the commons as we remain in God's word. So how, though, do we live in this in-between? Longing, waiting, how do we live in this cultural moment? If I had a title of this message, it would be more likely uh, the way forward. Okay, the way forward. We thought it'd be good to pull out of Joseph for a moment and talk about the way forward in this particular cultural moment. And as we lean into the summer, and we're going to dive into much more of this in the fall, so I'm kind of setting the table for us, we're going to be walking through the Sermon on the Mount throughout the fall, all the way through the fall. We're going to be teaching the Beatitudes in our Connect groups for four weeks. We're going to take a deep dive, and we're going to talk about what it is to live in this moment as God's people. I'm going to talk about that today. A lot of what I've been thinking about for a long time, reading, researching, and I'm excited to share uh, this passage with you. Um, we're going to answer some questions today. We're going to answer three questions, and then we're going to look at three identities. I could call them storylines that we must live out if we're going to be the people of God in the world today. I think they've always been true, but I'm going to apply it to where we are now. The three questions we're going to ask, if you're taking notes here, um, on the first part of this, this message, the kingdom of God, let's talk about it. What is it? Okay, let's talk about it a little bit. How do we live in it? And then what does this look like to live in the kingdom of God? What does it look like? This is where we'll get to these three identities. So this is where we're heading. Now, this is all over scripture. Uh, so there's no singular passage, but this is a great one. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. So go ahead and turn there. 1 Peter 2, 9 uh, through 12. I want you to look at this with me. Turn in your Bible, because you always bring your Bible to church. You don't need the one in the pew rack in front of you, necessarily. Um, and so let's look at this together, because I'm going to just read the passage first, not, not show it to you, but just I thought it would be beautiful just to read this over us. But to place it in context first. This is so important, always. Our scripture starts to say what it doesn't say. This is a problem. The scriptures will never say what it never said. This is Simon Peter, one of the 12, you know that, one of the key early leaders, priest on the day of Pentecost. He's a key early leader in the church. Later in this letter, we know that he's in Rome, okay, which he calls Babylon, by the way, which is key and noteworthy to understand this whole letter and this passage we'll look at. The theme of this whole book uh, is, is one of exiles. That's how he starts the book. He says, to all the exiles, okay, in the diaspora, okay, dispersed throughout what is now modern-day Turkey. So he's hearkening back. We're going to see all kinds of hyperlinks that run from this passage back to the Old Testament. Noteworthy, these are Gentiles primarily. He's now saying, you all, and you know this in Scripture, the epistles, Paul does this all the time, Peter does it here. The you is always plural, almost always plural. Y'all is how we'd say it. Y'all, all of you. This comes into play uh, here as well. So he outlines, I mean, the book could be outlined this way, three sections. One, he starts by talking about the new family that we find ourselves in. Then he's going to talk about how suffering is actually a powerful witness that none of us desire, but these people are under great persecution and suffering. And, and it's, a, it's a purifying fire that burns away the false hope that we place in other things. And other people, by the way, in a political season we end up entering into. And then thirdly, how our suffering helps us focus on the future hope that we have in Jesus. Again, we've sung about it today. So in what we call chapter 2... He's contrasting their holy lives, we've talked about this, separate, 
different lives is what it means. Holy before the Lord, set apart. And he is saying to us, how many Gentiles in the room? Anybody, we got any here today? That'd be all of us, mostly. Um, He's talking to us, all right? So listen to this, just listen to this. But you, y'all, are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. Y'all are a holy nation. God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. But now you are a people. The people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. Dear friends. I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Friends, if we could apply this passage alone, This coming year would look very different in our lives. And we would stand out as the people of God. We can do better this time around. Because the Spirit of God is leading us. We've learned some things. He's describing here what it is to live in the kingdom of God. He says, you are the new exodus. You are the new covenant. You're the new Israel. You're the new people of God. You're the new temple. Y'all, men and women, y'all are the new priests. You're the ones who are bridging the gap. You are because of what Christ has done. You're the new family. And and, and so he, he then is answering this question for us. And we see it again throughout Scripture, clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. What is the kingdom of God? Let's, let's delve into this. On a week that we celebrate our freedom in our nation... What does it mean to live in the kingdom of God in our nation? Notice it's not a nation, it's a kingdom, right? It transcends all borders. We don't know a whole lot about kingdoms in our day, but but it's not a national people, it's a people from from all over the world is this new family that he has formed. And and Peter is saying, "You, you need to understand the history that's being played out and it's continuing on. You are God's chosen people. So he's going back, right, to their history. You know this. They were chosen by God. They were rescued out of of slavery in Egypt. They went into the wilderness, right? He called them together under a new covenant. The whole covenant, the keeping of the law, was to set them apart. Live like this. You're going to be weird among the nations. That's how we're going to be light to the nations. They didn't do this. Instead, they went against the law of God and his holy commands, so they are sent into exile, right? Key key moment in time. But don't miss this. This is important to understand. We have always been exiles. God's people have always been exiles. Here's what I mean. I mean, think about it. Abraham left his homeland to go somewhere out there, and God would bring through him a people. We saw in the book of of Genesis through uh, Joseph's life. He was, think about this, the very first Israelite who shows up in Egypt goes there as a slave. We've always been exiles. In fact, the giving of the law, again, was that you all would live as exiles in the world, set apart. You, You don't belong in the world as the world, living like the world. Instead, you're to be separate, different. You can see how all this tracks through the New Testament, through the teachings of Jesus, and on into Revelation, where it describes what it is to live as exiles in Babylon. So they're to live. So then comes that moment. They're sent into exile, living in Babylon. But watch this. As exiles in Babylon, not as citizens of Babylon, not as citizens of the empire, but citizens first of the kingdom of God. What does that look like for us today? So hang with me. The entire purpose of all creation, 
is the unification, the coming together of heaven and earth. God walking among his people just like he did in the garden in perfect fellowship with them. Our, our disobedient ancestors sinned against him, were exiled from the garden. We've been trying to get back ever since, and we cannot under our own power or strength. And so the, all of history is trying to get back to the garden. Well, then the, ta- then the tabernacle comes, then the temple, which was a, not only a hearkening back to the garden, even in its symbolism and the way it was built, but it also foreshadows then the garden to come. Because all of history is heading to the new Jerusalem on the new earth. And, and we see that it's all heading there. And then here's what, Je- then what happens. Jesus comes. Uh, he, after, after all the exile, we wait in silence. He comes. The very location of the presence of God now is in the person of Jesus. He shows up in the flesh. He then dies on the cross for our sin. So that we could be forgiven, taking on our punishment, calls us in to be a part of his family, as Peter describes here. And then he promises the Spirit to come. Watch this. Our bodies now, the temple of the Holy Spirit living in us, every one of us who who follow him. We live in the kingdom as we obey him. This kingdom of God, here's my point in all this, it's not some far off thing. That we just can't wait until we're zapped up and out of here. The kingdom of God is now. Jesus said, he ushered, at the beginning of his ministry, I've come, he's preaching the kingdom. He's come and he says, the kingdom of God is among you. So the kingdom of God is wherever God's will is done by his people. And it is advanced as we live lives of worship to our king Jesus. That's the kingdom of God. So how do we live in it? Okay. Hang with me. we got to put our thinking caps on. Uh, simply put, you don't need to put your cap on for much of this right here, but hey, uh, loving God, loving others. That's how you do it. That's what Jesus said, right? Love God, love neighbor. That's, that's it. But we have wrestled with, and, and understandably, how do you live? How do we live as disciples in the kingdom, in the world? This is worth really thinking about, and I've done a lot of research and reading and thinking about this, particularly over the past year, that I'm unpacking a little bit here today. Augustine was one who wrote the city of God, his classic city of God, which was in contrast then with the city of man. How do you live this Christian life in the world, in the kingdom of God? More recently, it was actually 1951, Uh, Richard Niebuhr wrote a book that becomes a primer at seminaries um, called Christ and Culture. We've referenced this book before, but in it he offers these these options that I won't take time to dive into. You can sort of get a gist of it. Christ against culture, okay? Christ of culture, Christ above culture, Christ and culture in paradox, and then Christ the transformer of culture. Now, more recently, uh, Preston Sprinkle real name, um, is, uh, is an author and a podcaster, but he's written a great book on exiles um, in Babylon. I think it's In the Shadow of Babylon, among other books that I've been reading lately. But he offers, I think he takes all of this, and he offers three simple options, okay, or possibilities. And I say, I'm, I'm saying this because all of us fall here somewhere. He says detachment, uh, transformation, and then prophetic witness, all right? So first is detachment. And I want to see where you land. How do you really live? Detachment is that Christ against culture, if you will. It's noble because we're called to live holy lives. So here's what some people do. It's it's a monk-like life. That's the whole, right? I'm out, away from the sin of the world. But what can quickly happen is, I, and this is true for some of it, don't engage the world. Jesus would have likened it to putting a lamp under a bushel. If you're living a holy life and no one's there to see it, the proverbial tree falling in the forest. Does it even matter? He calls us, he sends us into the world, not to be of the world, right? So we know this. There's detachment. The other that could happen there is this Christ against culture. Niebuhr is, we see a lot of this today. Christians are against everything. Not going well for us, by the way. We're often known for what we're against and not what we are for. Not a prophetic witness. He, he then goes on to transformation. 
Okay, this is Niebuhr's Christ Transforming Culture, I think. Um, where we live, this one sounds great, where we live holy lives in culture. But he offers this danger. It often ends up power with culture. See, another way to frame this, people talk about um, power over culture, power under, power with, or power of the Holy Spirit in us. So there's different ways to talk about it, but here, transformation often ends up being power with. And particularly, this is really difficult in politics. And I praise God for Christ-centered politicians. But what happens so often is temptation leaning into power. That's not the way of the kingdom, by the way, as we'll see today. Instead, we start looking like citizens in Babylon instead of exiles in Babylon. And this is a real tough thing to discern. Uh, because what happens, it, it often does get us into trouble. A, a glaring example of this would have been January 6th, 21, where we see this conflation of religious symbols and violence. That's not the kingdom of God, right? And we all know that. But th because this happens, here's what it is. It happens when the ends justify the means. We're seeing a lot of that in our day. Where in the kingdom of God, listen, the means are the ends. Now this takes faith. To live out the fruit of the Spirit, for instance. To live out the Sermon on the Mount. To live out the Beatitudes. The manifesto of the kingdom from Jesus. We have to have faith to do that. Because it often looks like we're losing. Wait, I'm going to step into this relationship? I'm going to die to myself and serve them? There's no way to win. It's an upside-down kingdom, and we need to fully understand it. Because what happens is we see a political division when we, when we get co-opted by partisan politics. What happens is we've seen it wreak havoc on the American church. We are above it all. Because we know who the king is. Our allegiance is to him alone and not to any kind of misplaced partisan hope. And if you watched the debate the other night, I don't know if you're placing your hope in American politics, but I'm guessing you stepped away and thought, maybe not a trustworthy place. When we see a debate reduced to two men arguing about their golf handicap. Oh! <sighs> And hey, to the degree that you get crazy about that stuff, angry and whatever else, is to the degree you're placing trust in that. We know who the king is. Jesus is king, and he will be king today as we live for him. He will be king in November, and he will be king forever. We live in his kingdom, and we live differently. We are to be a prophetic witness. That's where it lands. What does this mean? look like it doesn't look like culture warriors we're not warriors we're witnesses to what to the way of the lamb who was slain wait what does that look like let's talk about it what does this look like well in the first century it looked like people proclaiming jesus as lord master king all the way to their deaths because you know this don't you to proclaim Jesus as Lord from the baptistry and when they were baptized or before other people, it meant Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So I want you to look here. This is the, really the heart of the message. Three core identities, okay? I could call them storylines. And if you take notes on sermons, I want to talk about it. I'm convinced this is the way forward for us as a church. I'm a pastor of a local church. I'm not talking to the American church per se. I think it applies everywhere. But for us, this is where we're heading. We are disciples, we are exiles, and we are servants. And I want to unpack all of this, okay? So first, we are devoted, dissident disciples. I'll explain each of these. Peter will explain it for us. Jesus will explain it for us. The first thing I want you to see, we've said this before, it's possible to self-identify as Christian and not be a disciple. Jesus only called disciples. 
They didn't call Christians, as it seems we have become in these days. He called people who were fully on. Our allegiance is to Christ our King alone. Look at how Paul says it again. But, he's in, in contrast to those who stumble in disobedience. But you, y'all are the chosen people. Royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession. Look at that. Bought by his precious blood. As we enter into the Lord's Supper here in a moment. That, this is the ESV, in order that, for this reason, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You would proclaim it by the way you live and the things you say. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Blessed, the good life belongs to those who are merciful because there's the kingdom of God. We have received mercy. Next, we are resilient, resistant exiles. Look at this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners, sojourners, pilgrims is what your translation might say. And exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage, wage war against your soul. We live, as Stanley Howarus calls, we are resident aliens in Babylon. That's who we are as a church. I heard N.T. Wright last week say, the church is a working model of new creation. People see us and they go, those people are different. How they love each other. How they serve others. How they're not about themselves. Look at this. Finally, we are selfless, subversive servants. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, or I might add parenthetically, they think you're crazy because you don't agree with all the crazy human sexuality stuff we have going on in the world, or they think you're nuts about how you're going to care for immigrants or refugees or whatever it is, or because this is how we are going to go about justice in the world. We won't be co-opted because we don't trust the empire. We will bring about justice in our relationships and how we serve others. Okay, I'm offering paraphrase there. They think you're crazy because you hold to absolute truth. That they may see your good deeds. They might disagree with you completely. But they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our good life. Watch this. We serve others so much that it makes them scratch their heads and go, why aren't you coming back at me because I'm ready for a fight? And say, no, I'm above all that. Jesus showed a, a powerful kind of indifference, a confident indifference to the political affairs of his day. And you might go, well, yeah, he's, he was king. He didn't, he didn't care. He's above it all. He's the king above all kings. We're to live that way. We are the ones who live as non-anxious presence in the world because Christ has rescued us. We're disciples first devoted to him and look at this uh, unpack each of these we're disciples we're exiles we're servants right but look at these descriptors we are devoted we are resilient and we are selfless that's who we are radically devoted to jesus we are resilient nothing shakes us because we know the end of the story we know who the king is and he is over all and now these next descriptors will make you go hmm like reading the Beatitudes. Like, is Jesus serious about this? Or the Sermon on the Mount. Really? Who lives this way? Kingdom people. That's who. We are dissident. We are resistant. And we are subversive. And here's what I mean. We are dissident disciples. We have no other master but Jesus. We proclaim him Lord of all. Again, we have a confident indifference, even to the political affairs of our day. I mean, we've got to vote someday, right? I mean, that happens. And I praise God. I know believers who are in politics. Praise the Lord. Some of us are called into that. 
But it's a very dangerous and difficult place to serve. And we need to pray for our leaders. We're called to pray for leaders. And that was even to a people who were being oppressed, who had no political power whatsoever. And so we, we, we do not conform to this world. We have one king, and we know how the story ends. But listen to this. We, we see all the way into Revelation that we live in every era with lion-like power manifested through lamb-like sacrifice. You know who the victors are in Revelation? The martyrs. The ones who die for their faith, willing to die. It's the blood of the martyrs are the ones who are victorious. We are willing to die, praise God, here in America today. We are not dying like Christians are in Nigeria. But we die to ourselves daily so that we can live for others. We are resistant exiles. We know we do not belong to this world, but here's the thing. We're resistant because our weirdness is the holy life that we live before others. We're not like everybody else. And it's exactly in that distinction that we become a prophetic witness, pointing to another way to live. So we are distinct because we resist the vitriol, the hatred, the polarizing rhetoric. We resist the temptation to actually believe the news that we hear that is so slanted. We are discerning and wise. We let Scripture be our guide. We resist being deceived by the evil one. We resist being sucked in or co-opted by the powers of this world. We do not need to cultivate a relationship of privilege with powers. Do we believe this? I want to offer just a personal word. Your pastor is not going to seek out and cultivate relationships with privilege of the powers of Babylon, of the empire. Because we're going to live with Jesus as our king. While politicians are arguing over what to do with immigrants and, and, and refugees, we're at the border serving them. That's how we respond. As, as they're, they're debating over what to do with refugees or people who are from other countries, we have established the Bob Herrera Ministry Center in Vickery. And we, where they just had a big VBS, by the way, that was awesome this week. We don't ask them, where'd you come from? What are you doing here? We ask them, do you know Jesus? Do you know our king? Do you know? See, the political task of Christians is to be the church and to engage the world with a, watch this, a political alternative that the world would never see otherwise. That's who we are. We are united in Christ. And we are living out the power of the Spirit in us. Showing the world who Jesus is and what it's like. We are subversive servants. Here's what this means. We have a sneaky way of bringing change into the world. And it's not through worldly means. You see, all of our engagement, whether political or otherwise flows downstream from the person of Jesus and our devotion to the king. Not in opposition to it, not as a distraction, but as proof that we belong to him. It is a kind of submissive resistance. We, we're not starting revolutions. Jesus has already done that. Where we come alongside him. And he says we live as servants but we also live as serpents he says why is it serpents innocent as doves why because you are sheep among wolves now go how do you how do you win over a sheep how does that happen well we live like jesus and we serve love is our superpower love is our brand and through persuasion persuasive love and servanthood, we win the world. Do we really believe this? We will not place our hope in a president being elected. We place our hope in Jesus. 
He is the king of our lives. And all of this should spur us on, friends, to serve him more than we ever have in our lives. We need more people to be disciple makers. We need more who will come alongside the youngest ones among us. We have more and more preschoolers coming, more young families coming, and we need more and more people to say, I I can serve a baby. I can do that. I'd love to do that. Serving parents who come just to say, I want to to finally have a place where we can come, maybe for a minute, focus with adults on some things. Friends, is that you? Where are you serving? He's raising up the next generation among us. Because we know, here it is, the problem in America is not our political system. The American experiment is still the greatest experiment on the planet. And it was John Adams who said, he was the second president of the United States, but he, a Unitarian, um, he, he said our Constitution, you've heard this, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly and inadequate to to the government of any other people. That's the church's job. See, we are disciples, exiles, and servants, and we serve everyone around us. And this week and in the months ahead, we're going to devote our lives right now. We're not going to be co-opted by the craziness of this world. We will live cruciform lives like Jesus, and we'll serve the Lamb who was slain, and we'll live like him. So we'll close with this before we partake of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 16. You read it this week. Why these dwell readings are so important. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Wow. Put that one up. And live that out in the days to come. I love living in America. I'm going to celebrate the 4th of July. I'm glad I don't live in Nigeria. I love Nigerians. Some of the most amazing people I've ever known. But I've learned this, when it comes to the kingdom of God, don't travel alone. It's dangerous. And you might not make it home. And it's a lot more fun to travel with others. So if you have not found a church home, today's your day. If you've never received Christ, today is your day. And if you have, we want to welcome you to join us as we partake of the ordinance that he's given us to remind us of what he has accomplished for us so that we can live to his glory and live for the king jesus our lord so let's all pray together as we set our hearts on the table lord we we thank you for this this time that we get to share now to partake of the ordinance that you have given to us and lord we we now set our hearts on you and we prepare our hearts as we Meditate and focus on what you have done for us. So use this time all to your glory, we pray in Christ's name.